Uh, sometimes we try to do those kind of things. It's been good already to be in the Lord's house, and I don't want to. I don't want to worry your patience this morning, but I do have a, a thought I'd like to share with you all today, and I've heard already through prayers and and through Brother John Michael's uh, words of testimony and kindness that he spoke. I heard. Something goes right along with kind of what the Lord's placed on my heart today. And, and I want to look at a few verses of Scripture, but I want to try to dissect things a little bit this morning. I want to start with, with a simple verse of Scripture. Isaiah 41 and 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So I would just tell you this morning that when the fears and the problems and the doubts of this world tend to get upon us and tend to pull us away and tend to distract us from the goodness of God, I want you to remember in whose hand we stay. For the child of God, we remain in the hand of Almighty God, and He is our fear in our times of helplessness. He is the one that can strengthen us and the one that can uh, lift us up and help us through the difficulties and the trials of life. And we remain in His hand. So, I just want to encourage you this morning. I want to, I want to look at, my thought would be, I can do all things. And naturally, your mind's probably, everybody here, your mind goes to Philippians 4 and 13. And we think about the verse of Scripture, and, and you'll probably hear it several times, that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We're all familiar with that verse of Scripture. We use it uh, uh, frequently, and I'll tell you, sometimes I think we kind of use it a little bit tongue-in-cheek, and we just kind of use it as a fallback. And, and uh, I'll tell you, we, uh, when I was trying to get my run in, going a few years ago and I've got to get back at it because I've 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 blowed up pretty big (laughs) but when I was doing my running there was the one day that I decided I was going to go for my four mile run and that was as that was as much as I ever got trust me with when when you got a a a half a flipper it's that, that that four miles is a lot so I decided I was going to set out on my four-mile run that day, and, and the one thing I prayed was, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And we use that a lot. We'll say that anytime things get difficult or things seem like it's going to be a little bit of an uphill battle, but I want us to, I want us to think just a little bit more deeply on what Paul was talking about in, in the Philippian letter here as he was thanking the Philippians, and that was a thank you letter, basically this epistle was, where he was thanking them for what they had done uh, in his life and how they had helped him and what he had uh, been able to experience in his life. And, and it's going to, maybe you'll look at this a little bit differently as we think about this verse of Scripture, but in Philippians 4 and 10, it says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. So sometimes people want to do the right thing and the opportunity doesn't present itself, right? So that's what he was saying to the Philippians here. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, I, want to, I want to dissect this just a little bit this morning. I've never, I've never really had this thought about these verses of Scripture, but I want to... Uh, I want to think just a little bit more deeply on that these, these verses of Scripture as we get into this. And I want us to think about contentment. And I preached one time at, at, a, at one of the churches I was pastoring about that a church should never be content. Uh, and and I, I will change that word a little bit. And I'd say a church never needs to be complacent. Now that's there's a little bit of a difference there. I'm never going to be complacent, and I know that, that people often ask me, what do I want for McFerrin? I've had that question a lot uh, uh, since January. What do I want for McFerrin? Well, the easy fallback crutch answer is, I want whatever God wants. Doesn't that sound easy? That's an easy thing to say. Well, whatever God wants, that's exactly what I want. But I'll be honest. If we examine it just a little bit more, we'll find that there's probably things that we all want. Honestly, I want McFerrin to be a powerhouse in Nashville. 
I want McFerrin to reach out and I want lost souls to be impacted by our lives, by our influence and by what we do here on every Sunday morning. And not only that, what we carry with us as we go out those doors, I want us to be impacting lives every single day as we go out into this lost and dying world. Do I want McFerrin to stay the same? Quite honestly, brothers and sisters, I'd like to see McFerrin grow. I'd like to see every pew full of people. I'd like to see hundreds of lost souls pouring into this place to desire to hear the truth of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, how does that get accomplished? That's where I don't have those answers. But I'll tell you what, our lives, how we live and what we do when we go out those doors, I believe personally has a tremendous impact on that. Now, that's, uh, that's, where, that's, that's where it gets a little bit tough. But Paul here is saying, now, I know that you all wanted to help me. I know that you wanted to do some things, and, and you weren't able to do that. You lacked that opportunity. And he said, but I don't want you to think I'm wanting. And this morning, uh, as we try to think about this, I would just ask you, if you were to list your wants, what do you want this morning? I read, a, uh, I read the 23rd Psalm this week at a funeral, uh, as, as we commonly do at gravesides and things. We, we think about that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, really, when we get down to it, what is it that you and I want? If we were to list those, uh, what would come to mind or what would be at the top of that? Hopefully, our friends and family and acquaintances and the people that we don't even know that are lost, we would want them to be saved by God's grace. That's what I hope we want more than anything else, because I think that's more important than anything else. But then we start to think about what we want in life. Most of us want a a, a comfortable bank account. We want a a comfortable home and we want nice things. And and, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not going to try to beat up on anybody for, for wanting to have some comfort and have some cushion. But we can't get so consumed in having things that we neglect what's really important. And that is our spiritual walk and well-being. And that's what I want to try to to look at just a little bit this morning. What we find that the apostle here is saying that therewith to be content. I want to look up the word content and see exactly what that means. And I'll give you the Webster's again. I use the 1828 because I just think it goes along with scripture a lot better. He says rest or quietness of the mind in the present condition. Satisfaction which holds the mind in peace. Restraining complaint, opposition or further desire. And often implying a moderate degree of of happiness, a moderate degree of happiness. Now, we want to walk through life and have the extreme degree of happiness, don't we? That's only logical. We're human beings. It says a wise content in his, excuse me, a wise content his even soul secured by what not shaken nor by wealth the Lord. Acquiescence. That's a tough word. Acquiescence. What does that word mean? And a lot of people, that's a, that's a theological term that a lot of times will get thrown around. But when you get to looking at that and you start to think about that, it says a silent submission. Satisfaction without examination. Now, I want to challenge you a little bit this morning. I want you to examine the moments of your life when you have experienced satisfaction without examination. Because quite honestly, most of the time when anything good happens, we start to examine how that we got there so that we can repeat that in the future. That's only natural. Uh, we find that when we do things that uh, we have uh, the, uh, the brain is stimulated by the things that we do, whether it be exercise or, or maybe it's something we read in the scripture, it's spiritual or it can be physical. We strive and our body starts to desire to have those experiences. Again, quite honestly, I'd like to force to have uh, more of those services where everybody's shouting and everybody is uh, uh, moved and God's moving in our services and, and people are on the altar and people are joining the church. I'd love to see more of those services. I desire that because quite honestly, I really enjoyed that. Why did I enjoy it the most was because I recognize that there was satisfaction without having to examine the source of that. My friends, I want us to have a walk of life where you and I, no matter what comes our way, we are confident and we are comfortable, not in the world, but in our God. I want you to have a life where we go into it and we say, my goodness, God is blessing me. Now, we think about Paul and we think about his imprisonment. We think about his conditions and we think about what he endured, uh, having been shipwrecked and having been beaten, having been imprisoned. Paul did not have an easy, enjoyable, pleasurable walk of life all the time. 
He had a difficult way to go. And sometimes we have difficult times and we find that we strive to find some way to get out of it. But what Paul is really trying to examine and what Paul is really trying to say here is just be content with God's provisions in your life. Now, we want, we want this or we want that, but if we really want to have real, true peace in this world, and as this world seems to get more evil, and this world seems to get more uh, distracting, and this world seems to, to maybe get bigger than we are sometimes, we've got to remember that we are small, but our God is large. Our God is big. He is awesome. He's above all. And He is overbearing over everything in this world. And when Satan and his darts seem to be flying at us, from every direction we're distracted and we're worried and we're scared just remember what Paul's trying to tell us here don't be so tore up by everything be content and trust in God Paul was not worried about whether or not his conditions were improved or would improve and we find in 1 Timothy 6 and 6 through 8 it says but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out and having food and raiment let us therewith be content now how often are you and I realistically how often would you and I be able to say if I've got food and I've got clothes I'm going to be perfectly happy. Is there anybody in here that's ever really said that in your life? I, I'm not going to raise my hand. Why? Because I want the nice house. I want the nicer cars. I want those things that I want to have. And we find that, that we desire to have that. But Paul's trying to tell us here, if you really want to have that deep abiding walk with God, be content with his provision. Don't strive after worldly things. Don't strive after trying to uh, get a better job all the time or, or whatever the case may be. And I understand that many of us in this room today are struggling. And, and I've, uh, I've started to, to pay more attention to that. And I apologize that I haven't paid much attention to that as I should maybe in the past. I, I, I went through, and I, I said not too long ago, I went through the whole COVID thing. And I, I blew right through it and got sick, got over it, uh, went right back to work. And, and uh, I wouldn't have missed any work if they had to make me stay at home just because my mindset was let's just get this over with go through it and move on I didn't realize that my brother or sister right beside me may be having a greater impact whether it be spiritually or psychologically or even physically as a result of the same thing that I was going through I blew through it just because that's my mindset. I'm that push through kind of guy most of the time. And I'll just say, well, we're here. We're going to get here. We're just going to push through this. But sometimes we need to recognize that others are hurting right beside us. Your brother or sister that sits right next to you in the pew that you're sitting in today, maybe they've got things in their life that you don't even know are going on. Maybe there's a, a big old storm in their life and they're trying to work through it and they're trying to push through it. And if all we are concerned about is saying, well, look at what I've got. Look at where I've been. Look at what I can do. My friends, we are missing the point of trying to extend ourselves in God's ways to our brothers and sisters by being content. Content. Sometimes we just need to say, you know what? Lord's given me food. He's given me clothing. He's given me shelter. I can be comfortable in those things. I can tell you I would not enjoy uh, uh, riding from uh, White House to, to McFerrin on, uh, every morning on a bicycle or on the back of a horse. But you know what? If that's the provision he provides for me, I need to be comfortable with it. If he's given me food and I've got shelter and I've got the, the, the clothes on my back, I can be comfortable and I can be content. That never, nowhere do we find the scripture says you're going to have a bed of roses to lay on every night and a, and a simple uh, level walk every day of your life. And I don't want these uh, that have recently been saved to think that being a Christian and getting saved by the grace of God means that everything in your life is going to be just, just perfect. It's not. It's going to be difficult. You're going to have trials. You're going to have some problems. You're going to have adversities in your life. You're going to have those that are going to oppose you. You're going to have people that are going to tell you that your God isn't real. You're going to have people that are going to try to tell you that, that you're just caught up in emotion. My friends, don't worry about what the world says. Worry about what God says. God says, rely on me. Look unto me. Seek ye me. Look unto me. All those things that we see time and time again. God's trying to remind us that if we'll look to Him, He'll provide our every need 
in life. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 lets it says, Let your conversation be without covenants and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what men or what man shall do unto me. Do we worry about people? Do we worry about the person that we're, uh, maybe is opposed to us? Do we worry about what somebody thinks? Do we worry about what somebody's feeling? Do we worry about all those things? Again, I encourage you, church, to just worry most about, is God content? Is God pleased with my walk? Is God pleased with where I am? Where do I, how do I need to get closer to Him? How do I need to draw closer to His will in my life? What do I need to do to be a better Christian? And for the uh, individual who may be here and is lost and separated from God, my prayer is that you will start to look unto God and say, what must I do to be saved? Because if you don't get saved, I'm telling you, nothing else matters. If you die lost and separated from God, there is no contentment for you hereafter. I really believe that. It's, it's only going to be far worse suffering. Philippians 4, 19 and 20 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God will supply all your need. Not necessarily you want now, but your need. Now unto God our Father be glory forever and ever. That's the other thing. When we find that we are in a point or a place of contentment, church, I'm not saying we need to get complacent, but we can be content. When we get to a place where we are content and we finally find that we can relax in the goodness of God. And that's one of the things that I feel like our churches are struggling with. And I feel like Christians are struggling with is being content in God. It seems like we just are, are bombarded on every side by the worldly things that distract and pull our attention in so many different directions. But God is saying, look unto me. When we get to those points where we... We lack that contentment. We need to get right, centered right back where we need to be. And when we do get to that point where we find that contentment and that peace that comes by, comes by relying upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my friends, just as John Michael did a few moments ago, we need to give God the honor and glory. That's the other thing I think too often we as Christians fail to do. We fail to say, God, you've blessed me. You've given me everything that I need. You've provided my every need. And I'm going to stand and publicly. And so, folks, I really truly believe God's people need to publicly thank Him for His goodness in their lives. Not just privately. We need to do it privately all the time. But we need to publicly give Him honor and glory. In the 12th verse of uh, Philippians there in the 4th chapter, we find that, that uh, Paul says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. And I want to ask us this morning, this is where I want us as, as God's people, I want us to dig down just a little bit. I want us to look at ourselves. I want us to examine ourselves. And I want us to think about when we say, I can do all things. Do we truly believe that? Do we really apply that? And do we really understand that? And that's where we find that he says in that 12th verse, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I want, again, I want you to examine yourself. I want you to think about your life. And I want to look at those two words, abased and abound. How many of us in this room today had to come to church hungry? Anybody? I haven't eaten breakfast yet, so I'm, I'm hungry. But it's not because I don't have provision. It's because I don't eat before I preach. But how many of us are, are hungry? Is there anybody in here? And I know nobody wants to raise their hand. And even if you were, I would tell you this. If you had to come to church hungry because you don't have enough provision in your cabinet, my friend, you come see me after church. And we're going to talk. We'll make sure that you have provision that you need. We'll make sure you've got the food that you need. We'll make sure that you're provided for. But realistically, to be hungry, to suffer need, a base means to be hungry, to suffer need, to depress, to bring low, humility, to crave, to be destitute, to fall, lack, and suffer need. How many of us in this room this morning really fall into the category of having ever in our life really been abased? Anybody? Probably not many of us. Except for that point where you finally realize that you were lost and separated from God. 
I think that's really the point that we understand what it really means to be a base when we really realize that we have come to this point where we can do nothing on our own, where we come to the point when we realize that we need Jesus, when we come to the point that we can't get saved and we're concerned about heaven and we're concerned about hell and we realize that if we don't get it right, there's no way to go to heaven and we start to worry about that, then we start to really understand hungering and needing and being a base and and suffering and being brought low and humility and to be destitute because quite honestly when we were lost and separated from God what did we have to offer him absolutely nothing nothing when you're lost and separated from God you can't say God I'll give you this God I'll offer this to you and I'll give I'll give all of this to you because honestly you have nothing to offer him he has already offered you everything you need. And that comes in the form of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I've been abased spiritually because I found myself in that need. I found myself hungering and thirsting after that righteousness. I found myself needing something that I couldn't provide. I couldn't go to the store and buy. I couldn't order on Amazon or Walmart or wherever it is that we get our goods. Uh, I couldn't get any of that anywhere in any of those places. What I found was, well, actually, Amazon didn't even exist when I got saved. I know that's hard for you young folks to believe. We didn't have cell phones when I got saved. I'm so thankful for that. Because if we had, I don't know if I'd have got saved. Be honest with you. Why? Because that's the I, I, I've said it from this pulpit before. I think that's probably the greatest distraction that our young folks have in their life. I really believe that. I think it's distracting all the time. And, and it doesn't matter uh, uh, how smart we are, how uh, uh, well off we are, or anything else. Folks, everybody, the, the, the wealthiest person and the poorest person on earth needs Jesus. Everybody. Regardless. But if we'd had cell phones, I, I, it, we, I don't know what would have happened. I don't know where I'd be right now if I'd have had a cell, a cell phone that's made in my hand, especially at church. And I've often said, put them up, put them down, throw them away, go, whatever you got to do. Put it on airplane mode. I've, I've said that time and time again. Stop allowing the world to distract you from your great need. Because as long as you look for that distraction, I promise you it will present itself over and over and over and over. But when you get serious about your soul and you get serious about trying to figure out what you need and you get serious about trying to get down to, to figuring things out, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how smart we are or how unlearned we are. We absolutely need Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you, my friend. No matter where, what point you're at, if, you've, uh, if you're lost and separated from God, if you've never been saved and you think and you realize and you know, I should say, that you need Him in your life, my friend, I want you to understand that you do not have to remain in that destitute, abased condition. You have a solution to your problem. And that solution is Jesus Christ. Paul goes on and says, I know how to abound. That means to be full. So while we are hungry, when we're abased, then when we get to know the Lord, then I would dare say all of us who have ever been saved would say, certainly in that moment we experience fullness. We knew what it was to be in excess because we felt the Spirit of God pour into our souls and we understand that. And even it goes on and says to fatten as an animal. Well, I'm taking that in pretty serious. I like that part. We like to eat and be full, don't we? We like to be able to have everything that we want. And I, I, yesterday was just a terrible day. I ate the most garbage that I've probably ever eaten in, in, in a long time yesterday. I actually started Friday. I ate pizza. And it just it spiraled out of hand from there. It just, that's just the way it goes, isn't it, sometimes? But we find that in those moments that we are full in the things of the world, guess what we are? Most of the time we wind up feeling pretty empty. By the spiritual realm. You see, if you fill yourself up in the things of this world and you try to take all this world has to offer into your life and you try to introduce all these ideals and things. I'm a, I love technology and things like that. And something will come out and, and they'll come out with a new watch, for example. And they'll, they'll, they'll throw that little bone out there to you and they'll say, oh, this watch will do this where the last, uh, the last generation of watches didn't do that. But this one will do this. And our minds are drawn to those things. And we say, I need that. That new watch. No, we don't most of the time. 
Yeah, but it monitors my heart now. It used to not do that. Now I can keep up with my heart rate. You know what? That's a gimmick. Those are things that uh, I would encourage you. If you think you're having a heart attack, go to the hospital. Don't rely on your Apple Watch. There are doctors. That, I mean, not that this is a bad technology. It's pretty cool. I do it occasionally. I'm like, oh, am I an atrial fibrillator? Nope, I'm not. I'm good. So as long as it's not AFib, you think we're okay. Well, guess what? You can still be having MI. You better go to the hospital. Don't rely on the things of this world to solve the solutions of our hearts. And I know that that's a, a, a simple example. But my friends, the condition of your heart really needs to be examined by somebody that is a specialist in that. If you think you're having a heart attack, don't come to my office and talk to me about it. Go to the doctor. Go to the hospital. Go to that specialist that knows what to do in your condition. And if you're lost and separated from God, I promise you, the specialist that can examine your heart and fix your problem is God Almighty, not me. It's not this place. It's not an altar of prayer. I want you to understand it is you and God. It's that relationship that's established when you get saved by His marvelous grace and when God looks at a heart that is broken and needing and abased and destitute and weary and has and, and you realize that you have nothing else to offer, that's when God steps in and that physician can take care of your great need. I would encourage you in those moments to look unto him. Realize that you've got to have what you need in your life and what you've got to have and what you really need is not necessarily always what you want. When I got saved, I don't know that I was thinking about things in the, in the sense of need and want. I wanted to marry Shannon. Shannon. That I wanted. I knew that. That was beyond a shadow of a doubt. I knew that's what I wanted in life. I knew if I was going to be able to get to that point, I needed to go to church. Because her daddy wasn't going to let me take her away from church and her mama. So I knew what I needed to do. I knew that's how I needed to get where I needed to be so that I could have what I wanted. But in that, God knew what I needed. Because in my trying to go and, and see Shan, and my going and, and visiting with her, and my going to church, my friends, I continued to hear the gospel. I continued to be impacted by the Word of God. I continued to realize my sinful condition and what I really needed. Thanks be unto God at that youth retreat on September the 19th of 1992, God met my needs and He saved my soul. Without question, don't have any, any questions about it at all. I can promise you today as I stand here that I know what it feels like to be saved by the marvelous grace of God. In that moment, I went from being abased that I went to abounding. And I went from being empty to being full. And I went from having all these mighty needs to having everything I needed met in that one moment span of time, whatever it is. Don't know how long it was. Don't know what that span was. Don't know how long I prayed. I wasn't baptized. I didn't uh, I follow a preacher. I didn't raise my hand. I didn't sign a card. I didn't repeat a prayer. I simply begged God to save me. And thanks be unto him, he saw my need. He saw the condition of my heart. And my friend, our God, say the such as being of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. If you're broken and you're needy today, I want you to know he can meet your needs here this morning. I want us to look just a little bit deeper. The apostle says, I can do. And if you break down the Greek and you start to look at this, it seems that means to have force or to have strength. Now, when we say when I was starting out on that four mile run that day and I was determined in my head that I was going to go four miles, I didn't care if my foot fell off. I didn't care what else happened. I was going to make that four miles. There was just no stopping me that day. But I asked God for the strength and the grace to do that. And I really, truly believe he in that moment gave me what I needed to have that confidence and that assurance, because I do believe God wants us to take care of ourselves and I, I pushed through it and I made it and I was so thankful for that but I can do I can have the force I can have the strength I can have the ability to do all things that means all every or whole now if we go back to the 11th and 12th verses what are we looking at there all or whole 
No matter what, whether things are good, whether we're abased or whether we're abounding, that means that God's strength and God's grace is sufficient for us in that moment to have everything that we need through, and that is that, that, that instrumentality of Christ Jesus. He is that instrument and it's for His sake and He gives, and we give ourselves to Him wholly and then through Him we find that Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, the promised Savior of the world, strengthens and empowers us. Now that's how that works. It's not through my physical strength that morning when I set out to go that four miles and I knew that's what I wanted to do. My friend, it wasn't that I was able to do it, I don't believe, on my own. I, I'm not a runner. It's, it's just awful to see me try to run. It looks like a, it's just not pretty. It's pretty sad is what it is. It looks like a poor wounded creature trying to make it across the finish line. It's not good. But I just trusted in God to push me that little bit. Give me that strength. Give me that empowerment. Give me that mindset and that mentality because I wanted to do it and I wanted to be able to in the end. And I honestly, as and when I finally got done and I stopped and I thought about it, I had to stop and thank God because He had enabled me. Not because of who I was or what I was. It was almost impossible for me to think about even being able to do that. But I am thankful that He enabled me. That He gave me the strength and the courage and the ability, the mindset and the spirit to be able to accomplish those things. I'll be honest with you. Brother John Michael already made mention of it, so I'm going to go ahead and say it too. I am thankful that none of our youngins got impaled yesterday. I was worried about it. I know what would happen if you'd give me and my brothers when we were junior youth. What age was that? Five, fifth grade to six to six to, okay, six years old. <laughs> when I was six, my oldest brother was fourteen. I promise you, he would have said, "You've got three seconds to run," and then he probably would have shot me with an arrow. That's just the way we grew up. That's the way it was. He would say, you got three seconds. And I, if I didn't run, he'd shoot me with whatever he had in his hand, whether it was a BB gun or a slingshot or whatever. We, we raised up kind of rough, I guess you could say. But we liked to beat on each other a lot. And I was worried that these youngins might come back and somebody would have a, an arrow through their foot or something. But God provided. I know that sounds extreme, but you know, that's just you give young folks uh, bows and arrows, things can happen. But God provided. God takes care of. And I I was worried about it. And somebody mentioned it at the deacons meeting yesterday. Like, oh, the kids are... I was like, please, I don't even want to talk about it. I don't even want to think about it. We're just going to trust and pray that they come back safe. And they did. That may be an extreme example. But folks, God provides when He... If if people will listen, He'll provide our leadership. In Ephesians, we find that, uh, that it says that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with, his, uh, by, with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Now, I told you when I set out to run, folks, I didn't miraculously grow muscles. I didn't miraculously uh, grow the rest of my foot. I didn't miraculously be able to go out and do something that was anything. I'm telling you, God works with the hearts of men. God works on our hearts after we're saved. He works on our hearts before we're saved. He works on our hearts throughout our Christian walk. And what we learn is that if we'll rely on Him, He will grow us, He will mature us, He will prosper us, and He will give us everything that we need that we might be able in that inner man to grow and recognize. And I want to tell you again, church, give thanks. If God has given you any blessings of life, if God God has enabled you with anything to be able to accomplish or do His will, if your needs are met, give God thanks. And later in in Ephesians 3 and 20, it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. I want you to think about this God that we serve that is able to do exceeding abundantly above everything that we ask or even that we can think of in our minds. Our God is so marvelous and so awesome and so miraculous that He can do everything, that we, He can accomplish those things if we'll allow Him to use us and say, God, use me. It says, according to the power that worketh in us, unto Him be glory through Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. It's all in Him. It's all about Him. We are weak and He, he is not. He is our, sto- our source of strength. And we find in Isaiah in the 40th, I'm going to read a few more verses of Scripture. I'm going to blow through these quickly. And I would encourage you to go home, maybe jot these down. Go home and think about these things and and, uh, consider them if you would. 
Isaiah 40 and 28 through 31, it says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. My friends, if you are trying to rationalize God in your mind, you will not be able to do that. I'm just going to tell you right now, our God is so much higher and so much more miraculous and awesome and marvelous that our minds cannot conceive the goodness, the power, and the ability of Almighty God. We can't do it because He is that much higher and better than we are. But I'm telling you, if you look unto Him, He can give you exactly what you need. It says there is no searching of His understanding. I want you to understand who it is that we're dealing with. We are dealing with a God that can speak universes. We are dealing with a God that speaks galaxies, that speaks planets, that speaks humans into existence. If you think you're any, if you think you are even remotely ready to stand in in a confrontation with him in a battle of wits, I will tell you, you will fail miserably. Because we can't match up with him. Proverbs 17 and 22, and this is this is one of those things that's been on my heart this week as I, I know that people are hurting and I know their hearts are heavy. I hope that, 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 this, that God will speak to you through these verses of Scripture and that you will have, be able to have a heart that is changed and merry as you leave this house today. It says, A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. A merry heart is like good medicine. It's medicine for our soul to have a heavy, a, a, a merry heart, even though we may have a heavy heavy heart, we can ask God to make that a merry heart. He says, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Proverbs 3, 5, and 8. Everybody knows this. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. My friend, if you're lost and you're trying to figure out what salvation is about and you're trying to figure out how you can do that on your own, you cannot do it on your own. Church, if we're trying to figure out how we're going to be, where we're going to be 10, 15, 20 years down the road, and we're trying to use our minds to rationalize how we're going to accomplish certain tasks, my friend, we're missing the mark. We have to trust God in those things, and we have to look unto Him. Maybe I already told you I wanted to see this house full. I'd love to see hundreds here lost. My desire is that that would happen, but I've got to trust God and ask His leadership and His guidance to get us there. We're not going to get that if we rely upon our own. Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. Church, everything, let's acknowledge God's goodness, God's benefits, and God's uh, majestic and supernal ways above everything else. Acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. If you really want to be content in God, depart from evil. If you keep taking up evil in your life, you'll not have contentment. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Psalms 147, 3, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. If your heart is broken today, I want you to know that whether it be from the things of the world that have just weighed us down and, and drug us down, maybe you're lost and separated from God. I want you to know that the same God can meet the needs of everybody in this room. If If you just need some healing, if you need some encouragement, if you need some lifting up, my friends, God can do that. If you're lost and separated from Him, I want you to know He can meet your needs here today, and He can do that as well. He can provide your every need today if you'll just look unto Him and acknowledge Him. He heals the broken heart, and He binds up the wounds. Jeremiah 17 and 14 says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. I close on this verse because I think this verse is pretty important. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Don't rely on yourself for salvation. Don't rely on yourself for strength. Don't rely on yourself for encouragement, my friend. Just look unto God. He is that that can heal our very broken heart. 
If you've never been saved, I would encourage you to seek the Lord. You need to seek Him while He may be found. You need to be calling on Him while He's near. You need to be acknowledging Him in all your ways and understand that He can meet your need right here this morning. You don't have to leave this house lost and separated from God. You can be saved today before it be everlasting too late. So Brother Marty, if you get a song together, Brother Eddie, whoever's going to do it, I would just ask you this morning to examine yourself. Church, maybe, I see our churches, sometimes we get, we get heavy laden, don't we? Sometimes we have burdens and we have trials and we have tribulations. And I see that it weighs heavy upon our hearts. But you know what? Even through the midst of that, we can be happy. We can realize that the Word of God is, is that medicine that we need. We can realize that God's Spirit can sustain us and help us. We often say, lost person, you can come up here and seek the Lord for the salvation of your soul. Maybe us saved people, maybe we need to come out here and pour our hearts out to God as well. Maybe we just need to say, God, get me where I'm content. Get me where I'm pleased. Get me where I'm pleasing in your sight. Not necessarily in our own, but pleasing unto Him. So while we have a song.